I hate to have to report this. The breaking news just into CNN is that actor Robin Williams is dead at the age of 63 from an apparent suicide. This is absolutely shocking and horrifying. And some people say, Robin, I'm a functioning alcoholic, which is you can be one. It's like being a paraplegic lab dancer. You can do it. People were drawn to him because of this electricity, whatever it was that he radiated that, that propelled him and, and powered him. Another generation has lost another bright young comedian. Tonight in Chicago, there are tears at the death of Chris Farley. Comic actor John Belushi died today. Sam Kinison's funeral will be held at Forest Lawn in Los Angeles. This morning, we've learned a popular comic from St. Paul has passed away. Mitch Hedberg died in a hotel room in New Jersey. We just lost Brody Stevens. It's such a hard one to take because everyone loved that guy. So heartbreaking that such a funny guy. Yeah. So we hate to lose comedians. You know, why is it so many times the people who are the funniest deep down have a horrible sadness? Are comedians more depressed? I bet there's a lot of depressed stockbrokers. I don't know. I'm no expert. Just another white guy in his 30s with glasses who does comedy and gets sad. Uh, there must be something to it. Like, you know, if we're making a documentary, there must be something to it. If ignorance is bliss, then the opposite must be true also, where clarity is misery. I have this theory that maybe percentage-wise, comedians aren't more depressed than the rest of society. Maybe the rest of society just isn't talking about it professionally. The question of like, can you tell us a little about your journey with mental health? That's a tough one because it's like either a very long story or the bullet points get scary fast. You want to know about my journey? <laughs> I wish people focus more on people's journeys these days. Wow, what a question. Getting right into it. Uh, hello, my name is Baron Vaughn. I'm a person who lives life, so therefore, I experience anxiety and depression. All of us learn a skill set inherently as children that gets us through childhood. A hundred percent of comedians become comedians because somewhere in their childhood they needed to be funny in order to survive. I started being funny because I was imitating my dad, who's really funny. And my brother's funny, my mom is funny. So funny was just a common language in our household. If you could make people laugh, you could take down their defenses. And if you could take down their defenses, they would listen to you and they might even like you. That survival was finding a way to be funny, to diffuse a scary household or abuse or to be the first one to make a fat joke before someone else does or you might be the only Jew that anyone knows and I was like covered in black hair and tiny with big teeth that didn't fit my tiny head. All those things were fed into how I became a comedian because I needed to be funny, to be liked. Just being good at this and trying to be funny and trying to be smart and trying to get the laugh, that's the thing that I was able to use to self-soothe. Maybe it's because I was such an insecure work little creature that I needed that laughter to feel good about myself, but I absolutely, it did get me high, and I loved it. In fifth grade, I did a solo talent show act. It was basically a one-person sketch that I wrote called The Me Station, which was all about a TV station where there was only one person playing all the parts. And I made everyone laugh, and it made me more popular. I mean, I can only say that in those binary terms because that's all that matters when you're a kid. It literally, people respected me more. I'm the youngest of 10 kids, and early on, I was like, ah, something's not right about this. I don't know how much energy I'm supposed to have, but I feel like I don't have enough. I don't know what people are walking around with, but I feel like based on civilization, other people have more than I do. When I was eight or nine years old, I must have had my first panic attack, and I didn't know what it was. I remember thinking that if I ate more food, I would feel better. <laughs> and so I, for years, I just thought, oh, this means I'm hungry. 
a panic attack is basically the inverse of an orgasm. It's like the worst feeling you could have. I had a sense that something was up. Probably around like fifth or sixth grade was when I started to feel a little bit aware that I was not on the same wavelength as the people around me. And uh, by eighth or ninth grade, I was very deeply in my own head and already very, very adept at hiding how I was often feeling on the inside. You know, there's a difference between like, this is who I am and I feel sad today, then I'm so sad that I don't feel like myself. Depression is so vague, but it's insidious in that it's like, no, you're sad because you're the worst. And then you're like, oh yeah, I am the worst. I was in college and it actually first manifested as issues around eating that later turned out to just be a mask for depression. Yeah, I have a lot of anxiety. I don't know, I feel like it's weirder to not have anxiety than to have it. I think before that, I kind of thought everyone maybe went through these periods of melancholy and sadness and they were just maybe handling it better. The point of everything felt like it was a race, almost like you were reading a book and you always knew the way the book ends and then suddenly, you realize all the pages are blank and you're like, I don't even know if this is supposed to be a book. It just kind of, the bottom fell out of everything. I was put on Xanax at 13. They just upped the dose and upped the dose and upped the dose until I was taking four Xanax four times a day. The psychiatrist who originally put me on it hung himself. <laughs> I mean, I can't just skate by that, it's crazy. Since I was 16, it's been a process of learning how to manage panic attacks, general anxiety, agoraphobia, and certainly depression. I've been diagnosed as having low-grade dysthymic depression, which is kind of an inability to experience joy. Every girl I know is two things. Freezing. <laughs> starving. Saying I don't know how to experience joy feels like you're not gonna be on the top of anyone's list. Like, who should we get for the party? Well, we'll, we'll get the guy who doesn't experience joy, of course. There aren't a lot of upsides. I remember it was the night before I started fourth grade. I went to go to sleep and I was nervous about the first day of school and then I started thinking about all the things I was worried about and then all the things I was guilty about, which is weird because I I wasn't raised religiously. <laughs> I don't know where that guilt came from. And I stayed up all night, I didn't fall asleep. And I have my fourth grade picture, it's actually my Twitter picture, is my school picture taken after I hadn't slept all night. So I have these like dark circles for a nine year old. And that basically started a period of what I now know to be basically obsessive compulsive, looping and intrusive thoughts. And it basically led to stomach problems. They thought I had some sort of virus. I just I had constant diarrhea from thinking and worrying. I was depressed. It's such a taboo subject. People don't want to talk about it um, or people feel like they can't talk about it. My parents' generation, crazy people got stuck in a fucking hospital where they got chained to the wall and electrocuted and lobotomized. Like, so I get why that old generation's like, don't talk about this stuff. I used to just be riddled with insecurities and always trying to prove myself in some way because I felt kind of less than everywhere I went. And so I'd try and overcompensate for that. And I would overcompensate in some ways by being a dick. <laughs> From the very start, I want a man who can build a bridge to my heart, and it's you. Uh huh, I said it's you. Depression makes you think about you and all the shit that you can't do, that you didn't do, that you will never do, that you've done wrong, the people you've done wrong to. Someone on the outside goes, Oh man, you get to travel all around the country, and you're getting to be on stage in front of thousands of people, getting the pats on the back and everybody, hey man, I wanna buy you a beer, shit's great, rah! Then you go back to your room, and it is lonely. You were just on a high, and now you're by yourself, 
anxiety, especially for a creative person, is our creative talent, our creative abilities that we have turned into a blunt object, and then we continue to hit ourselves over the head with it. The spiral that you can go to in anxiety is just good writing when it comes down to it. It's good storytelling is what it is, comedians especially. We believe that these feelings are our creativity. I don't know much about J.R.R. Tolkien, but when I watched Lord of the Rings, I remember feeling like that fucking guy who was in King Theon's ear, who's just like, no, don't fucking trust anybody. None of these people have your best interests in mind. You only fucking listen to me. I was like, I wonder if J.R.R. Tolkien had depression, because that's my depression. It's right here, and I'm so fucking tired and miserable and beat up. And everybody's in front of me going, why won't you let us help you? And it's in my ear going, don't trust any of these fucking people. They don't have your best interest in mind. And I always felt like Gollum really reflected my substance abuse issues. So I don't know what Tolkien went through, but I bet he and I would have a lot in common. <laughs> Humor is how we all survive. It's not just comedians, but I think a lot of people find humor in the darkest places. Chappelle did a joke about me where he said um, he was gonna write a self-help book for me called Just Drink, but I don't, I don't like drinking. His point is like, well, you don't think I'm depressed? Like, man, just get drunk. It's fine, it's part of the human condition. Just think about me when I was like a 19-year-old comedy nerd starting out, depressed, fucked up, looking for any excuse to not get help. And the fact that some of my heroes were messed up was a justification for that. Our first guest tonight plays a sort of creepy character, Dwight Schrute, on the hilarious NBC series The Office. Say hi to the very funny Rain Wilson. Once you get famous, there's all kinds of weird pressures that get put on you. So for an insecure, kind of anxious guy, all of a sudden you've got all these other pressures I was in Vancouver filming a TV show. I felt like I did not have a right to feel the way I was feeling because I was employed during the recession. And I was on a TV show in a different country with great food. I mean, you want some good food. I'm talking Vancouver. It was just a, a malaise that I just felt heavy all of the time. But I didn't think I was sad, which is why I didn't recognize what was happening because I thought, maybe I'm depressed. No, I don't feel sad, so that couldn't be what this is. I would wake up, get my laptop in my lap, be IMing all day, and then suddenly it was nine o'clock at night and I hadn't gotten out of bed the whole day. And that would go on for weeks. I had a box of Cheerios that I, that just, I would just go through. That's all I was eating was cereal. I was bathing with Dawn dish soap because I would run out of soap and didn't want to go to the grocery store, which was a five minute walk away, by the way but it felt like it was so far away. Breakfast cereals, oh man. You ever notice that sugary cereals are, are on like the bottom shelf of the cereal aisle and healthy stuff's at the top. So when I, at 2 a.m., finally find the 24-hour grocery store to indulge in my shame, I'm told a story as my gaze drops of who I should be as opposed to who I actually am. When I was in college and it got at its worst, I had one of two dreams. I would either have a dream where I got into a uh, confrontation with someone that got to a point where I went to throw a punch and I would not be able to complete the punch and everything would freeze and I'd just look. Or I had a dream where I would get out of bed and at the foot of my bed, I had this little um, bookshelf with my TV on it. And I would have this dream where I would wake up, see that it was about to fall, I would get out of bed and I would just quietly hold the bookshelf in place all night, making sure that nothing fell. And I realized at a certain point, I was in all this pain in my neck and my shoulders and my chest because I was actually sitting in my bed all night doing this or this. Like if you had walked into my room and seen me sleeping, you would have seen me physicalizing my anxiety dream. And when I say I had one of those two dreams every night for a year, that is not an exaggeration. I would start my days waking up in physical pain because of the level of anxiety I was feeling. I exploded up out of my dad's balls. That's a lot. It felt as fast as, I always say this, like when a cloud covers the sun and it's suddenly dark. It just was so 
quick from one moment to the next and all of a sudden I just felt this terror. At that point I had just been hired at Saturday Night Live and out of nowhere I was like, I wanna move home to New Hampshire, I'm gonna quit. I could show up at the UCB theater which was like the hot theater in New York City. I could be the guy who that night crushed the hardest and I was miserably lonely all day leading up to that in that room with 25 of my friends in it. I was miserably lonely on stage in front of 200 people who thought I was the funniest guy they saw all night. I was miserably lonely. None of it changed. I was talking to a friend and <laughs> I said something to the effect of, you know, um, I just feel like I, I wish I wasn't alive. Is that something you've ever heard of? And she's like, you want to kill yourself? I'm like, whoa, 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 calm down. That's not what I said, that's violent. I wish I never was. That's different, have you heard of that? And she was like, I think you're depressed. And it just like, almost like a light bulb went off. And I was like, oh my goodness, that's what I have been feeling for months. Do you realize that right this second, right now, somewhere around the world, some guy is getting ready to kill himself? <laughs> Did you ever stop and think about that kind of shit? <laughs> I do. It's fun, and it's interesting, and it's true. Right this second, some guy is getting ready to bite the big bazooka. Had a lot of uh, suicidal thoughts, but a lot of fantasies about something happening to me being the ideal so that no one would have to kind of be ashamed in my family. And uh, I wouldn't say I crashed a car on purpose, but the way I always describe it is there was an accident happening and I kind of went with it. When I was 17, I lost my little sister, Christina, to suicide. She was 13 at the time. And I had a lot of intense, intense depression and suicide ideation. Like, had this really terrible phase of taking drugs by myself in my room and drinking all the time. You, you, you don't seem to me someone who's like morbidly fascinated or, no. or, or, or hung up on death. No, so I mean, that's weird. I mean, when I was drinking, there was only one time, even for a moment, where I thought, oh, fuck life. I, right. And I went like, <laughs> then even my conscious brain went, did you honestly just say fuck life? I went, you know, you, you have a pretty good life as it is right now. Okay, let's uh, put the suicide over here on discussable. Let's leave that over here in the, the discussion area. We'll talk about that. My friend Mark Cohen, another comedian, he found some psychiatrist that would see me at like two in the morning in New York City. And I ended up seeing a woman who put me on Clonopin. That was the first drug I'd ever been on besides the whole Xanax thing in my childhood. And that actually really saved my life. My mom left me and my dad when I was two years old. I mean, you think about how bonded a two-year-old is to their mom. All of a sudden, my mom wasn't there. I didn't really see her again until I was like 15. I know this affected me in some pretty profound ways. Part of the reason that I'm so odd and don't really fit in and am so kind of strange and ungainly is because inside there's this abandoned child. My worst depression last year, I, it was so bad, I wrote like, don't kill yourself across my whiteboard. And my poor assistant came in and saw it. He's like, oh, you should change that to stay alive. And you know, sometimes when you tell people you have anxiety, they're always like, well, you know, there's nothing to fear but fear itself. It's like, okay, have you checked out some of fear's work? <laughs> I need to be honest with you all, I truly, did not want to be here. It's not that I don't love you all or I wasn't honored to be giving the baccalaureate speech. I do, and I was. It's just, I've been going through a really hard time recently. But we all have this trauma. The point is to transform that into being an artist, telling stories. And I'm the guy who played Dwight. So I'm supposed to be funny. I just don't feel very funny these days. We all have these kind of fucked up things that happen to us and we can get through them. You know, we can get through it and, and transform it and, uh, and use it. I think the guiding principle in everything that I do is to make other people feel less alone. I say that, but it's kind of a lie because it's really to make me feel less alone. It's one of the reasons that I love being a comedian because if I can find comedy people anywhere I go in the world, and I have, I know I'm gonna hear good stories 
and I'm gonna be sitting around with people who are also, if not okay with being fucked up, <laughs> at least perhaps more honest about it than other folks might be. What's gonna drive a person to get up on a stage and try to make other people laugh and be like, here, I'm gonna let you judge me for however long I'm up here. And I think that has to come from something very deep inside of you. And for me, it was because I felt dead. The only thing that made me feel alive was trying to make people laugh. Comedy is a way to translate your darkest thoughts into a form that gives it a little less power. These years of torture and shame kind of became my superpower. And I think all of us romanticized depression to a degree, but you know, I'd rather be well. There's nothing more important to me than being funny except being well. Ladies and gentlemen, the very funny Chris Gethard. Comedy is not going to save you. And if you are thinking about doing comedy as a substitute for therapy, it doesn't, it doesn't work. I tried. I tried for a long time. It doesn't work. My whole life, I've just been mocked. That's it, that's it. So nice to meet you, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> it's the most beautiful thing in the world. I love it more than anything, but it's not a safe space to go heal. I think performing can be a temporary high, but like all temporary highs, it doesn't last. And you can chase that high night after night after night, but eventually there's gonna be a club that's not open or you're gonna have a night off and you're gonna have to deal with what happens in the silence, so. Therapy helps you understand the things about yourself that you are blocked on. It helps you recognize your blind spots. Comedy can be therapeutic, but I don't think it's a substitute for therapy. I'm able to be a lot more interested in other people and what's going on around me when I take care of myself, because if I don't, then I'm just self-obsessed, you know, and you know, even if you're self-deprecating, it's narcissism, <laughs> you know, like you can't even see anything else. I was opening for Mike Birbigli on the road. We were driving somewhere in the Midwest. He said to me, what's the darkest it ever got? And I told him about the time that I crashed a car. And we got to the end. It was just the two of us. He just kind of nodded. And then he burst out laughing. And I was like, whoa. And he's like, you gotta tell that on stage. And I was like, no, that's the most fucked up thing I've ever done. He was just like, look, man, you talk about this stuff honestly, and you know yourself pretty well. And uh, you have a chance to make something that no one else can make. And without being too, you know, he wasn't twisting my arm too hard, but he kind of made it clear to me of like, you know, if you're an artist, who has a chance to say something that might actually connect with people or help people, and you don't take that chance, what good are you? Like, what good are you? I've had criticism from people that like, oh my God, you're exploiting your sister's suicide because it's all you talk about, making money off of her corpse. Like people say horrible, horrible things. But to me, it's like, yeah. If I had a before and after moment in my entire life, it's that moment. All I can do is make something that I feel would help me. We just did a Radio City and I signed 15 different pill bottles. I think telling stories is as old as humankind. There's something primally comforting. I was ashamed that I was having these feelings. I was ashamed that I was not perfect. Because in my mind, especially being a father, I wanted to be the best man that my daughter could look up to and go, oh, well, that's a man. Even years after I went public with it, after I did my show, This American Life contacted me, and they said, we want to do a thing, and you're one of the only people we know who's like weird enough to try something this emotionally risky. We want to have someone's parents interview them, but the person's not allowed to know any of the questions first. And I was like, yeah, that sounds interesting. So they had my dad interview me. And many years after my dad came to understand what's happening, and he and I never really talked about it so much. He, he just, you know, every once in a while, you doing okay? Everything good with those doctors? And I always wondered, is my dad a little disappointed in me? He asked me, he goes, how come when you were going through that stuff, you never talked to me? 
And I just said, well, I didn't want to let you down. And you always handled your stuff. And when you were young, you had so much more adversity to deal with than I did. It would almost feel like, like I was being an ingrate for not understanding how good my life is when intellectually I knew. And I said, and at the end of the day, I guess I just, uh, I didn't really know if you would be able to help me. And my dad said to me, I wouldn't have been able to help you. I would not have known how to help you. And that, as he said that, it filled me with like a panic that like my 13 year old self used to know. Cause I was like, man, I was right. My dad wouldn't know. But then the next sentence he said, he goes, but I would have run through a wall to find the person who would have been able to help you. And I felt so much regret. And one of my only regrets in life is that I underestimated my dad because that's my dad. And uh, that's him to a T. And he wouldn't have judged me. He would have, he would have done what it took to help me. That dude would have, uh, he would have kicked down every door in front of him to keep me safe. And I spent a lot of just bullshit years hiding from it because I didn't want him to be disappointed. And I could have saved myself a lot of agony. And I could have saved the people around me a lot of fear and a lot of anger and frustration if I had just let my guard down earlier. My mission initially was like make something that tells the truth for real about this stuff. And maybe other people watching it can go like, fuck yeah. But then I realized, no, that's happening pretty easily. The real mission is if your kid is sick or your cousin is suffering or the guy on the other side of the cubicle wall shows up and you never know which person you're gonna get, how can I make those people understand that that person's not being a dickhead that day, and that person's not being melodramatic, and it's not because they're going through a phase, it's because they're sick. If you aren't depressed, can I open the door and let you know a little bit what that's like? Because I realized it's hard to help yourself. My parents helped me eventually. I always wonder, like, if my sister had had like Googled why shouldn't I kill myself or something before she did it, which is something that these kids have done, which is how they've found my videos. It's like, would she have watched someone who would have convinced her otherwise? And is that all it takes, is for you to fucking record a video and tell people why they shouldn't kill themselves to really make an impact on a young person? Like, sure. There's a lot of I love you going on in the stand-up community. I think it's kind of us going, don't die, <laughs> don't die.